All right, Council Member Kendra Brooks, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So City Council's fall session is in swing now. What are some of your key goals for this session? Well, for this session, we are going to finally get our rent control hearing, which is next week, um, Wednesday, February the 8th. Um, and we're moving forward with the work we were doing on buying back the community gardens that were encumbered by the U.S. bank liens and return them to local control. Um, we're also focusing on connecting constituents to summer youth opportunities, you know, with camp, summer job employment, and making sure folks in the most impacted communities have access to those um, opportunities. Uh, and of course, our budget is coming, which will be, you know, our main focus. And we're using a transformative justice lens um, to make deep neighborhood investments and create self safe and healthy communities. So those are the priorities. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about that rent control, because this is in, in, in just my opinion, this would be a seismic shift and something that uh, is probably very needed in the city right now. Absolutely. How do you see that? How do you see that working? <clears throat> well, you know, I think you know, I'm being pushed to change the wording to rent stabilization, but whatever we're going to call it, it's going to be something that we need to do because we see the, you know, the rents have skyrocketed 7% um, on average this year. Um, and we know people are getting cost out the city. So, you know, we think that affordability is number one. You know, we realize that rent stabilization is like an anti-gentrification um, and anti-displacement measure. I mean, there's a number of ways to do it. Um, and we're looking to explore the best ways to do it for Philly. You know, a lot of the pushback say, you know, other places didn't do it well, but we're creating something that's just for Philly because, you know, we, we have to define what's right for us. Um, you know, one of the arguments we keep hearing is that it's gonna affect the uh, small property owners, but we want to ensure um, that we're gonna make sure that we, it's a check and balance, you know, just to make sure that everyone is getting a, a fair shake at this. We don't want to affect small landlords either. Um, and we realize that once we, you know, find ways to stabilize rent, especially in gentrifying neighborhoods, we'll be able to uh, kind of, you know, uh, not just stabilize communities, but it'd be a huge break for community members. And, you know, we had to create opportunities for affordable nonprofit developers, like by, you know, reducing the real estate speculations and kind of controlling the market. And that's kind of what we're looking to see. Um, with this, you, we realize that, you know, rent stabilization is an anti-balance measure, is an anti-homelessness tool. So there's so many different benefits from stabilizing rents. And we're going to do this rent control hearing to kind of get to the basis of what's best for our Philadelphia communities and primarily those that have been most impacted by gentrification and displacement. And, and it's one of those things, just like you mentioned, where when you, when you look at gun violence and you take a step back you're looking at poverty and when you take a step back the thing that feeds into poverty is homelessness so it, it, you know this it, it makes sense that now is the time to, to look at this um it, you had this was part of a package of legislation from i believe in june of 2020 as well um that and i could be wrong on the date but i, th I think that's what it was um it, so this time you're going to have the hearing. What has changed between then and now to get to this point? Well, I mean, we finally got our rent control hearing. I, like the pandemic was in the way to prevent us from even getting the hearing and beginning the conversation. Um, and, you know, this was the first bill that I introduced, the first piece of legislation that I introduced the first day of council. Um, so it was never off the table, it's just with the pandemic. And actually we brought this up again during our uh, renter's access, no wrong one, Emergency Housing Protection Act. Rent control was a part of the original pa uh, package, but we couldn't get it out of committee. Mm -hmm. So okay. it, it's just timing and I don't want it to, we have to have the conversation now, even if we're not able to move the legislation in this, with this council body. Okay. 
Um, so, so let's shift the budget a little bit. Um, can you tell me a little more about the lens you just described uh, and, and how you're looking at the budget? So, you know, <clears throat> as being a restorative practice, practitioner, you know, I believe that the only way we can move forward is to like really heal some of the harm that has been done. And uh, we have to address some of the structural racism problems, whether it's with the housing system, uh, with education, with gun violence, all of these things, we need to come together and figure out our budget proposal that's grounded in transformation. And we look um, over the years and we see how tax handouts have been given to the ultra rich at the same time undefended, underfunding city services. Um, that's how we got to where we are, by disinvestment in neighborhoods, disinvestment in young people, disinvestment in schools. Um, and I feel like if we look at those investment as a transformation, for the city that we want, then we'll be able to, you know, cure, not even cure, but help with some of the root causes of the number one thing that comes on the list is violence, gun violence in our city. And I think we can address all of that if we just get to these root causes. And some of it is about relooking at our budget, budget and transform the budget into something that affects all communities and stop working in silos. So a part of our transformative budget is like, how can we all work collectively together to work on all the things that everyone is talking about? The number one thing when you talk to constituent is violence and housing. That our, every I can't think of one council office that doesn't have a huge number of influx of calls around those two things. And education. So how can we do that together? So we're working on something. Um, we've been working on it for the last couple of, since I've been in office, but we decided to pull it together as um, a clear format of what does it mean to have a transformative budget um, and what does it mean to build a transformative city? Um, so that should be coming out in March, I think is our launch date for this whole plan and it slides right into the budget and it also slides into a clear platform of what I see for um, Philadelphia over the next four years if I'm reelected. Okay so so what you're going to be releasing is kind of like what your blueprint would be for the city budget? Mm -hmm. Okay now this and this sort of dovetails into my next question. You know, we there, there's a budget surplus, and there there are these federal funds that haven't been spent yet. Coming into this budget season, how would you like to see that money be used, if at all? <clears throat> I mean, we we have to use the budget around. We have to use that money around the issues that are most pressing. You know, we talked with the school district and make sure the money that was allotted to the school district is going to health and safe, healthy, safe schools for young people, and that's a multiple thing, like mold, asbestos, lead, and children be able to breathe while they're in the building, but also what does it mean to have a safety model in school that's just not over-policing, you know, so we need to make sure that we have mental health supports. I think uh, we looked at some statistics and they said that the ratios for child, for a child and um, a counselor in Philly, we're way beyond those ratios. I think it's like 50 to 100. And we're at like one counselor per school. They could have 300 children um, in communities that are highly affected by gun violence and poverty with huge amount of trauma. We can't expect young people to learn and thrive if we're not addressing their basic needs. And you can't move forward if mentally you're, you're held down. And I think we need to make those investments. So when I think of... Um, what does it mean to have a safe school community? All those investments need to be made. And that's with the school district. But then on the flip side, on the city budget, we have infrastructure issues. We have um, parks that, you know, still need, you know, lighting and uh, pools aren't open. We don't have enough staffing at pools. We don't have, they're not open on the weekends at parks and recreation centers, including libraries. All of these things work together because if we look at the population of, folks that are most impacted by this gun violence. It's a generation of young people that have received the most disinvestment in the city. So when schools started closing and programs started closing, if you count the years back, those are our 18 to 25 year olds. So what are we gonna do for the next generation? But also what can we do to offer them second chances on opportunities to really you know, be productive citizens? And when I look about the city budget, it's more than just brick and mortar. 
It has to be about people. Um, so part of this transformative budget, we're gonna we we're touching on all of these different um, areas to kind of bring it together and where the funding is gonna come from, whether it's some of the federal funding that individual city offices that have will be receiving or waiting to receive or have received as well as the surplus. You know, we should have a huge amount of money coming in with the Super Bowl. And the fact that our teams are going to the playoff, that is generating revenue that we didn't have before through um, some of the taxes that are connected to, you know, fun stuff like drinking and smoking. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward to, you know, how this budget year kind of reflects how can we have a vision for the city just this beyond 2024. We can't look at the future of the city in you know, three and four year increments. We have to look, what, what do we expect 10 years down the line? And that, that's how I, this transformative budget that I'm talking about and how we funnel the money that we have been bringing in that we will be bringing in into the city in a way that we can have the city of our dreams or close to it within the next 10 years. And if we don't do that, we're gonna find ourselves having the same conversations over and over again. I've been fighting the school stuff around building improvements for 15 years. The same argument. Yeah. All right, I'd like to bring in Denise Clay Murray here on Philadelphia Home Line here. Hi, council member. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I you you were talking a little bit about restorative, like a restorative justice framework for this budget, which in a lot of ways makes sense, but we're also, whether we want to talk about it or not, in the middle of a campaign season. And unfortunately, when people hear stuff like restorative justice at a time when we're also dealing, dealing with massive amounts of gun violence, that those two things don't match up all the time. So how do how do you communicate to that to not only like residents but people who are potential voters in a way that it, it explains not only that this is about correcting disinvestment but also about getting the problem of gun violence under control. I think it's and I don't think they conflict. I think is that and. I think restoration means investments in the root causes of what's happening, but that does not take away that we need solid solutions about what's happening now. And if we're talking about crime, we have a, a you know, most crime aren't reported. And, you know, when people want to talk about policing, the police aren't solving some of the crimes. So like, that's a separate argument, but it has nothing to do with us creating a restorative model for restoring our city. I think that the siloed model that we have seen needs to end. I think we need to make investments in the things that work. That means, you know, making sure we're doing prevention, also interruption and intervention. And then on the flip side, you know, if someone commits a crime, it needs to be solved. Like we can't talk about, you know, uh, real reform or change if we aren't solving crimes. Like the crimes need to be solved. I'm not taking away from that. So rest restoration doesn't take away the fact that, you know, there needs to be, I hate to use punishment, but there needs to be some kind of uh, outcome when someone creates, creates a crime, whatever it is, whatever it's prison or whatever. But at this time, it's not happening. Nothing is happening. The, the majority of the shooters in the city are running free. And nothing is happening. And that's the doom and gloom conversation gets us nowhere. I think we have to have this collective conversation about what needs to happen collectively, whether it's from, like I said, intervention, prevention, interruption, and also a solution, you know, to help solve crimes. And I think it's not that or, it's both and. Um, and that's how when I, and the reason I wish we're calling the transformative plan and not a restorative plan, because I feel like restor restorative has been used so much. And I want to make sure that we're talking about a way to transform systems. Okay. You know, because what a restore, we can't restore back to what we already had. You know, we have to do better. So we're talking about a transformation of systems that have already been in place. And some of these systems that has systemically led to some of these problems, like this disinvestments led to 
why we have this huge amount of young folks that are actively involved in, you know, violent crimes. And that, that's why I would, thought it was important for us to look at it from a holistic approach. You know, we can't just penalize young people when we disinvested in them in a long time. So we're okay. We're paying $40,000 a year to keep them locked up, but we only invest $14,000 a year in education per child. That's problematic. So I'm going to pay $40,000 for you to be in jail for the next $20, 20 years where I could have invested 12 years, 20,000, like 25,000. And on the outcome, we will have a productive society. So when I think of transformation, I'm thinking I'm bringing in my work as being a parent advocate, a youth advocate, a gun violence interrupter, you know, all of these things in the street now with my legislative experience and how can we bring this all together in a way that makes sense. And we can't do it just government alone. There has to be government and community. And these investments have to be kind of linked together with government investments and community investments. And the community investments may be time, you know, and energy that we have to encourage young, uh, all people, young, old, or just neighbors to come in together to do these things. And that's why, you know, I just wanted to kind of push back. I don't think it's either or, it's both and. And I'm coming from that perspective because active community engagement is what led me into politics, not the other way around. And how can we duplicate not just me, but so many other folks that are doing the work in the street, but it just goes unseen and unheard. And we need to find ways to kind of bring it all together to, you know, transform our city into what we all would love to see, the, the city that we talk about, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of politics, this is the end of your first term as a city council person. Um, what have you learned through this experience coming from an activist perspective that you didn't know before? Uh, the first lesson I learned was government moves slow, very slowly. Um, a lot of things I expected to be moving much quicker than they have. Um, I've been to, I've been using the word frenemies more. Um, because like, like I said, I entered this world from a restorative lens and I realized some people, we don't agree on anything and some people we agree on some things, but not everything, but we still are good allies and we can work together on things, um, to get to the, to the, to, you know, a solution. And I have shown that whether it was paid sick leave legislation that we moved, whether it was some of this housing legislation, like how can we get to a win? And I think that that was my biggest lesson learned coming from activism it's like no if there are no forever enemies around here like sometimes i have to knock on the doors of folks that i don't agree on agree with just to get to something that i really want and figure out what our mutual benefit is for us to win and i think that's how we're going to move some of this rent stabilization i have to talk to everyone we have to talk to the landlords and i think that that was my my biggest hurdle as an activist, you know, cause I come from protesting and shutting it down. And I think sometimes I, I can't shut it down. I have to engage in a way to move it forward, you know, the best for my constituents. Okay. Now, how do you, I guess, how do you, how will you manage to, um, cause I, I understand you're running for reelection. Um, how will you manage to do that and um, do what you need to do as for your constituents. I mean, is this something that folks have been giving you any kind of advice on how to, you know, get things done in an election year? No, but I definitely feel the burn. Um, <laughs> I believe that, you know, I have a strong team on both sides, whether it's my campaign team or my, my office team. And, you know, everyone will do their part to move the legislation that we want to move as well as for me to run a productive campaign, um, a productive winning campaign um, in this season. And I think it's possible. I, I'm expecting some bumps in the road, but that that's, you know, par for the cost. And I'm, yeah, I, no one has given me any advice about anything. It's kind of crash and burn around here. <laughs> Now you came in because I remember covering your campaign, and, and you came in 
with the, you know, if we're going to have a minority party, why can't it be the working families party? That was kind of, you know, your, your thing. And there are other people from working families that are running, you know, for the, um, for the minority council seats. Um, are you encouraged by what you've seen as a council member about, you know, in terms of them possibly, could you guys possibly become the minority this year? Um, yes, I believe it's possible. I believe um, when I ran back in 2019, they said that was impossible and it happened. I have a proven track record. I have shown that the Working Parent Families Party um, or the Working Party, Working Families Party line can deliver for working people in the city. Uh, multi-class, multi-racial uh, communities. And I think that the city has recognized that as well. And I think we have an opportunity now to, you know, take the, take other seats that were reserved for a minority party. And why not working families party? I think it's this the perfect time. And I think we have a proven track record. Okay. And one last question. The Working Families Party made an endorsement for mayor. Um, it was Helen Ginn, which was not a surprise to any of us. But she's recently kind of hit a bump in the road herself in terms of showing up at an event at the Union League, which has kind of you know, made people start to question whether or not that's an endorsement you guys should continue to make. Has, has have the Working Families Party thought about, you know, what they're going to do with this? Or are you kind of like, okay, we'll just work through it? Well, I mean, in, in all, you know, Helen has a 20 year track record for delivering for working families and that speaks for itself. Um, and that's what matters to me. That's what matters to our constituents, like our constituents want to work in families party. I mean, many candidates have a bump in the road. I mean, she has not been the only one, but Helen is the one that's most aligned with our working families values that can, has been most consistent over the years since she's been elected and prior to election. She was the first um, endorsed Democrat through the working families party in this in the state, in Philadelphia. And I think, you know, incident happened. She attended an event. Yeah, she apologized for it. And I'm not saying it, I'm not trying to, middle, you know, middle, you know, make, try yeah. to under, like, yeah, I can't get the word, you know, minimize it. But the reality is like, in the next three months, everyone else will be there too, um, in reality. And the Union League has been problematic before this DeSantis decision. And, you know, I think, you know, Helen critics, like, this is something that they could use to kind of minimize her. And, you know, I do think it was a misstep in her campaign. It was definitely an oversight. She apologized. You know, I've spoken to her about it. Um, and her track record still aligns more with the Working Families Party. And that's why she was the person that got our endorsement. From the out of all the candidates that interviewed, and our state committee has, you know, still holds firm to that. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, and we really appreciate it. And I'm going to give you back to Larry McGlynn, my co-host here on Hall Monitor, and you're listening to Hall Monitor on WPPM 106.5. All right, thank you, Denise and Councilmember Brooks. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me.